what the people in the camp had that we didn't have, that we lacked. And we may have lots of things that they lack, like physical stuff, like a house and food on the table and, 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 and a bed and all of these things. But they had something that was more important than all of that. And that was the community. And it was really, really clear to me that actually, yeah, they had love for one another and a real strong sense of community. And that was more powerful than, yeah, any of those things that we attach importance to um, and that was re that was um, that was the biggest and continues to be the biggest takeaway for me we actually deep down we're, we're searching for that often here in the west you're listening to the spaceship earth podcast with me dan burgess so welcome to episode 14 in this episode, I'm talking to the quite unbelievably awesome Jazz O'Hara, who is founder of the Worldwide Tribe. Now, the Worldwide Tribe call themselves a global community sharing the human stories which bring awareness to world issues. And they also support projects on the ground in refugee camps. Now, that sounds really um, organized and uh, focused, and it is. And, uh, you know, I, I um, encourage you to check out their work after, the, after this because you'll see this incredible work they're up to. But what's really interesting about this story is that it started uh, in such a um, beautiful way by Jazz and uh, her brother literally just deciding to do something about an issue which felt enormous. And that issue um, was of the movement of refugees coming towards the UK. And now if, you, um, if you're British... Uh, you might remember the summer of 2015 uh, when um, we were, as a country, um, there was a lot of volume around um, refugees coming uh, to, to Britain, a sort of story which was um, quite negative. It was all about, you know, um, migrants coming to coming to steal our jobs. Um, but you, you may remember a lot of this was coming from the fallout of um, the conflict in Syria. This uh, story uh, of Jazz and the Worldwide Tribe started from, from, uh, from I guess, uh, an underlying curiosity to understand what was really going on here. Uh, and this is what this uh, conversation with Jazz is all about, to really get under the... Um, under the skin of what was what was happening at that time. This story is just interesting on so many fronts. And um, for me, it's a story of sort of compassion. It's a story of kind of following your heart and your gut and your own intuition. It's a story about trying to understand something for yourself versus taking the kind of the story from the media that we're often told uh, and which creates knowledge in our societies, which often feels kind of poorly informed. Um, so this, was a, this is a story about really trying to understand what's going on by uh, putting yourself out into something and, and discovering for yourself. It's also a story of just doing and action and what happens when you kind of surrender to something that you feel very passionate about and just decide to go and do something and see what happens. It's also a story of not knowing and not allowing your lack of perceived knowledge or experience or understanding where something might go as a reason to stop you, if that makes sense. There's a beautiful story of just, yeah, not knowing, unknowing and just going with what feels right. This is also a story, I guess, of the the power of the social the social web. For all the dark side and, and, and the... The negativity around our, our usage of social media and the distraction, whatever, we cannot underestimate the potential and the power um, to help us connect to things in ways which we couldn't possibly do before. And I think this is this story uh, of jazz and uh, the launch of the Worldwide Tribe is just a beautiful illustration of um, being able to connect up to a big network of people that actually were also feeling something. Uh, feeling uncomfortable about something which the media was telling us. It's also very much a story of the heart and what it is to be human uh, on the planet right now. Um, and the work of the Worldwide Tribe, you know, it gives us a lot of insight into what some of us have access to uh, and others don't. Um, and actually a kind of insight into our sort of fellow human beings and what many people have to endure every day all really down to the fact of where they happen to have been born on the planet. 
Um, and it kind of asks us in many ways, or it sort of starts to pose the question of how we might look at people that are moving across the planet with a different viewpoint. Let's step back and look differently. Let's challenge our assumptions of why people are moving. And what might happen if we started to do that? So enough of me mumbling on. Uh, you can tell I'm a bit excited by this one. Um, sit back. Here we go. This is episode 14 of the Spaceship Earth with Jazz O'Hara from the Worldwide Tribe. Okay, Jazz, well, um, welcome to the Spaceship Earth podcast. Thank you for um, finding the time to, to join me. Thank you for having me. Now, we'll get, get into, you know, your work today, but I'm really, I mean, I, I'd love you just to sort of tell a bit of your, of this story. And I know you've told, you know, you've told this story, obviously, multiple times of the sort of the, the start of your, your mission that you're currently on. But the reason for me, because um, I, I remember this happening in 2015, um, I think it was 2015, wasn't it? Was it the summer it was, of 2015? Yeah, summer of 2015, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I just, I would, I mean, I would love you just to sort of make, you know, if you could just tell us that the, the, how how what you do today started. Okay, sure. Well, I, well, if you cast your mind back to that time, summer of 2015, it's tricky because it's a few years ago now, but um, it was the kind of the beginnings of um, when the refugee crisis or the migrant crisis, that it was kind of referred to hit our media. Yeah. Um, so the mainstream media was full of stories of especially people arriving in Lesbos um, on boats and also people trying to cross from Calais to the UK. So there was a lot in the news um, about the refugee crisis, but at the time it was quite dehumanising and there were headlines, quite famous headlines at the time, saying things like, swarms of migrants yeah, God, arriving you know, I, to Calais I, and things I remember like that. that. So, well, we had, we had, a, we had a, uh, a business, uh, a, a consultancy called Swarm and at that time. So I remember that headline. Yeah, so it resonated with you. <laughs> yeah, thought, with you. Well, actually, swarms are quite good, you know. Yeah. They can be. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, in this case, not so much. No. Definitely. In this case, there was a lot of negativity at the time. And you were um, living because you because you you you're from Kent, right? Which is like yeah. for people that don't know, is is sort of you know, it's 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 right on the 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 you know. You're, I mean, how far are we're you on from, the border? On you're the on border. the border. You're right so on the border guess, of the UK, right, in England, and yeah. So right in the south, and people are arriving from northern France to Kent, um, so crossing from Calais to Dover and to Folkestone, um, which are both in Kent. And yeah, I grew up in Kent. My family lived in or live in Kent yeah um, and yeah so I guess that's another really relevant point because what got me kind of personally interested in these headlines and the fact that the refugee crisis was yeah kind of so negatively portrayed at the time was because we were hearing about lots of unaccompanied minors lots of children mm. arriving to the shores of Kent or in Folkestone and Dover um, and my mum and dad had been going through the process for a couple of years actually by that point to um, take on another child to foster right. another child um, I was I'm the oldest of four um, yeah. and my youngest brother at the time was turning 18 and I think they were not ready to have an empty house <laughs> um, so they've been going through this process that's pretty all your parents sound pretty awesome that's they a... are pretty cool. They're pretty cool. Yeah. And things have developed a lot since then. Um, I now have three foster brothers. I'm skipping forward in the story, but <laughs> I now right. have so three just, foster just brothers. Just go back to that. Just go back to that. So in that 2015, so were you sort of, because um, as I say, I remember, I live out in the West Country, and I remember, but I remember that time, obviously, where it was building up in the media. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, and as you say, in a very kind of like, um, you know, the narrative was 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 pretty wasn't great it was very fearful and um but you know or at least in the mainstream media and then you're starting mm -hmm. to see this kind of you know you could really feel it i remember feeling this sort of sense of like oh blimey you know, what what's going on in this country what are we you know, yeah it was like people felt like they were scared of some kind of like invasion yeah right and we've had we've had a little bit of that recently with the channel um crossings and people arriving on boats it's kind of coming that's back right a that's bit. what i was, was going to say because it sort of disappeared for a while hasn't it but it felt yeah. like but just yeah, going back to where you were living, so were you were you seeing? Because <clears throat> you talk about the children, the younger children. So you were sort of seeing um, where you live. You were kind of you you were already seeing kind of um, I guess really visible signs of of more folks coming into the country. 
No, no. I wasn't okay. actually at all. So I would say that the visible signs were not there. The stories in the in the news were there, and I knew that people were arriving in Kent. Um, but it's not. I mean, like I didn't know any any refugees um, at the time. I yeah. had never met a refugee. I, it wasn't that you know you were seeing people suddenly on like Tunbridge High Street, like um, where I live. You know that had just arrived. It wasn't like that at all. Visibly, it, it, it didn't exist okay. um but i think the idea of it in people's minds people were, were, were fearful and also i was reading these stories about people arriving and uh, it felt very close to home because we were in kent mm. um but also yeah because my mum and dad were going through this this process um, so you were sort and, of a you were sort of awake a sort of awake to i guess this this relationship or yeah, I, I was. I had a, that personal interest, that family interest. Yeah. That we thought, um, you know, because my mum and dad um, knew that they wanted to take on another child, but yeah. they didn't specify that it would be a refugee. But we were hearing that more refugees were arriving to Kent, and yeah. lots of them were children. So we kind of put two and two together that that would be likely that my new brother or sister would be an unaccompanied minor coming via hmm. the Calais jungle, basically. Um, but at the time, yeah, it was before before uh, we that was kind of um, that had happened. Yeah. Um, but it was in the it was in the process, and my mum and dad were very open to taking on an older child and a child that didn't necessarily speak English or a refugee child, and lots of people w- were fearful about that. So how did you? Like can I ask you a question about that? How did you yeah, and your siblings? How did you sort of feel about that? What was the we were super excited about that. Yeah. I think, yeah, we didn't have any uh, any feeling apart from, like, excitement for having that new brother or sister. Amazing. And I remember the day that my first brother, Nez, arrived. And, yeah, I mean, again, maybe I'm skipping ahead, but it was <laughs> probably up there with the best days of my life oh, ever. It was really, ex- it was really exciting. I remember getting that call from social services, from Kent Social Services, saying that a boy had arrived. Um, he was fourteen, and he um, was in good health. Didn't speak any English. Um, had a sore knee, um, but otherwise in good health. And did we want to take him? And yeah, I remember that morning really well. I remember my dad like writing his name down on a piece of paper while he was on the phone like spelling it out huh. and then uh yeah and then quickly my dad went to the supermarket and was like um googling Eritrean recipes and was with my sister asking her like do you think this melon looks like something that you get in Eritrea <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. my sister was like I've got no idea <laughs> <laughs> So, 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 so we'll, we'll explore more. I'd, I'd love to explore more about your, you know, your your growing family uh, mm-hmm. a, a mm-hmm. bit later. But let's go back. So let's go back to the that summer of twenty fifteen. So you're okay. you're seeing all this going on. I'm seeing I mean, all this, yeah. yeah. I'm 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 not. I'm knowing that it's likely that I'll have a new member of my family that will be a refugee. Yeah. And I'm reading negative stories about refugees in the paper, yeah. and I'm intrigued about the the human side i want to know more about the people living in calais what happened to them and why they left their countries and what countries they left i didn't even really know you know at the time i thought refugees i assumed syrians but um i i didn't really know um i worked in fashion at the time and it was all uh, um new to yeah. me and uh, yeah and so i was intrigued so basically, I remember, as you say, it was summer and we were sitting in the garden. We were kind of chatting. Um, I was chatting to my mum and my little brother was still at school at the time. He was 18. Yeah. And he was a really keen, um, budding filmmaker. And my mum said to us, she was like, well, why don't you go? Why don't you go to Calais and see if you can find some stuff out and ask some people some questions and make a little film and answer some of these questions? Um, so and just, give, just give some context again to, <laughs> to folks that listen that are, are from different parts of the world. Just give a, a, some context of Calais and where it is and sort of what, what was happening. OK. So the proximity of that was, was also really um, poignant because... Because, as I said, we were in Kent in the south of the UK and um, this camp that we were reading about, this refugee camp that 
was not really an official refugee camp, but I guess a slum that had grown literally organically. Popped up, right? Just literally, literally sort of... popped up. I mean, there's there's been refugees in this part of northern France in Calais um, for a long time because that's where people are attempting to cross. There's a, there's the Eurostar there, so people cross from France to the UK very easily if you have the right passport. Um, takes half an hour on the train, um, but also where people refugees are trying to arrive to the UK by hiding under the train, in the train, in the back of lorries, um, things the like lorries that. lorries get onto They're boats as well. We and it's all just, mm-hmm. yeah, so this is the major crossing, right? This is the major, mm-hmm. the rail and ferry and... Exactly, it's the border, the, yeah. the French-UK border. Um, yeah, so, and that was from my house in Kent, an hour um, hmm. that you could get there. And from London, you know, you can be there in a couple of hours. So... Yeah, it's bonkers it when you think about it, isn't it? it? When, you yeah. think, when you think about it, it's close. To, it's easy for you to get literally to, on our to France than it is for you to get to where I live on the southwest of England. Yeah, absolutely, mm. absolutely. So yeah, so it was on our doorstep, and it seemed crazy that this camp that at the time, you know, it was it, not many people really knew that much about it, and um, yeah, we were interested basically. So me and my brother made that decision to go. Um, in the next couple of days and just see what happens Mm -hmm. the crossing is cheap and we we filled a car with what we thought people might need you know in very very naively we were like "Mm, yeah what did you what what, what, what did you take in that first round before you actually (laughs) got that so one of my friends runs a restaurant so I took his booker card and we went and got things like packets of nuts and like some bits of food and yeah. we had some warm clothes that you know we ha- we didn't wear anymore and yeah. Uh, yeah just some things that we thought that yeah generally food but we had no idea we had no idea we just did our best really in the, in those next couple of days but it all happened quite quickly because we decided to book it for it was like 3 days later that we went i think yeah so we headed over and basically, that's the day the, or that trip that changed the whole course of my life and what happened next. Yeah, so really. tell, it, tell, it, tell, it, tell, it, tell us, if you can, like, what, what unfolded. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> first of all, the reality of the situation was completely, completely different from what we'd been reading in the news and what you kind of were led to believe by the mainstream media. Because immediately, as soon as we arrived, mm-hmm. people were welcoming and friendly and they had these little tents in the mud you know 3,000 people lived there at the time and people invited us in and they wanted to make us little cups of tea over these fires that they'd built and um, you know they wanted to share stories and we kind of had these packets of nuts and (laughs) we were kind of giving them to people but also just talking to people and what I remember from that day was just being completely overwhelmed by the fact that you know I wasn't Yes, the conditions were shocking. Yeah. <clears throat> the fact that people were just living in these tents, yeah, literally in the mud and that there was no um, NGOs on the ground there at all. But what was more shocking to me was, yeah, how different the experience was to what I had expected it to be had I read, had I just been reading the headlines. Yeah. So can you give me an um, example? <clears throat> give, me, give me an example of that. Yes. So, for example, um, I met somebody I met a few people that day um, but I met somebody who became a really good friend of mine um, for years to come and still is Mm -hmm. um, who told me his story and he was from Sudan Um, so that's that's another example of uh, you know people there were from I met people from Eritrea from Afghanistan from Sudan um, from people you know fleeing genocide fleeing the Taliban fleeing all sorts of things that were not necessarily the war in Syria yes there were Syrians and Calais but they made up a small um, amount of the demographic of people there and and I think that was interesting at first because we kind of really thought about refugees as Syrians or at the time that's kind of what we associated. That was the the story wasn't it? Mm -hmm. That was the story Um, but the story was more complicated than that and that's what I learned as I met people that kind of represented the world's atrocities really so Mm -hmm. I met a Sudanese guy who was fleeing genocide in Sudan um, in Darfur and uh, he told me the most incredible heroic inspirational insane life story that you would just never expect to hear firsthand from someone's mouth and he had the machete scars on his legs to prove it and you know it was mad this story that he was telling me and 
Um, meeting him and meeting people like that, yeah, it really um, opened my eyes to something that like, I feel I had no idea about before that. Yeah. Um, and I felt very um, emotional about the fact that after that trip, it was so easy for us to get the train back to the UK in the comfort of our car with right. our passports and that these people that I was meeting there were risking their lives every day to make the same journey you know every night they'd be trying to get on trains and trying to and, and, and purely to seek asylum in a country that they would be accepted and granted their asylum um so the uk has a lot less um applications for asylum and you're much more likely to be granted asylum if you do apply in the uk than in mainland europe because of the the numbers basically yeah. um so i learned a lot a lot so it must have been quite it must have been really quite overwhelming that first experience i i can imagine because i'm guessing it really was because i'm, really guessing, was. I'm guessing the volume of of people as well that you're encountering yeah exactly i think it was overwhelming for me because i went from a very uh, it it changed my perspective on everything because yeah before that I had been lucky to have travelled a lot and you know I didn't think that I was in such a little bubble of kind of naivety but it opened my eyes to a lot of a lot of things that first trip and mm. the years to come since then that like I've been um, yeah um, a witness to many things that before that I had no idea what kind of happening around me. So you so, done so that first trip was like was it a, d a day, a couple of days? What was the? It it was one day. It was one it day. It was one and day. So you... We went early in the morning. Yeah. We didn't stay over. Um, and yeah, as I say, it wasn't it wasn't hard to get there. So it was just one day that first trip. So you're heading back, and you're with your brother, right? And mm -hmm. and so what was what was what was going on? Like what? <laughs> yeah, I was feeling really emotional about the. It really Im impacted me that first trip because mm. we'd met people that you know were my age um girls that like i really they i resonated with that i related to and their situation and their life was so different and their opportunity is so different from mine that it just didn't make sense to me that we had such yeah such different paths based on where we were born which is nothing that we do anything about it I just found it I found it really hard to put this new information mm. into a, a space in my mind that made sense it just didn't make sense and it didn't sit well and it felt it felt horrible that this was the case that yeah, I had to it's... leave and be like okay I'm, we're going back to the UK now um yeah, it was, it was mad. It was yeah. really mad. It affected me a lot. And I really felt like people needed to know um, about it. People that I needed to tell everybody around me that like this was the situation. Yeah. I knew that I wanted to go to the camp again. And that I, that, you know, people that day had been telling me that they were cold at night and that they were hungry during the day. And just those basic, those basic needs weren't being covered at all either. That was another shocking thing that I didn't meet any volunteers on um, that first trip. Um, I met one French lady, Maya, who um, continued to be and continues to be my hero because she was, um, yeah, an independent volunteer who, at the time, who um, was supporting people in the camp. And uh, they called her, lots of people called her Mama, and she was just helping people, getting them pairs of shoes and yeah, yeah. things that they needed. Um, but otherwise, I didn't meet anyone volunteering in the camp. I met some press. Um, but other than that, yeah, these people kind of, they're fending for themselves. Yeah. yeah. So you're heading back. You, you go. You you because you, this all happened really fast, didn't it? What mm -hmm. the, next, the next step? So, so what? When did you just tell us through the talk us through what happened next? All right. So I I, I got into bed that night, and um, I was doing what you generally do. I was lying in bed on my phone, <laughs> and uh, and I was on Facebook. Yeah. And I basically was thinking about the day and uh, thinking about what how I wanted to to move forward from there that I wanted to go to the camp again as I said so I, I wrote a, a Facebook post just on my personal Facebook page um, to summarize a little bit about what had 
what I'd experienced that day, the people that I'd met, um, the stories that they told me um, and that I wanted to go again, that people needed warm clothing, tents, sleeping bags, things like that. Posted it, went to sleep, got up the next morning to go to work, um, checked my phone and was absolutely overwhelmed to see that that post had been shared about 65,000 times in a matter of hours. (laughs) (laughs) Literally in a matter of hours, which was absolutely mad i didn't even know that that was possible it wasn't even on my radar yeah um yeah because yeah. i saw i mean because I, I saw that <laughs> part and i don't know how i you know i got it we got it because i because me and my wife because you'd put your address on it yes yeah which was very stupid <laughs> and i would recommend no one to do i've quickly removed it because yeah yeah because we just, cause I, we I, just I, pulled, I, I remember i was pulling together like i think we just you know a, a few jackets a few pairs of shoes bundled it up got it down the post office and then i remember following right your story exactly. a little bit and you ended up like because uh, you know explain what happened <laughs> So yeah, as you say, amazing people like you saw that post, saw that I'd said like, oh, you know, drop stuff off to my mum and dad's house here or my brother's house in Brixton here. Oh my God, we were absolutely inundated. Like (laughs) thousands of people, thousands of people responded exactly as you did. Putting together care packages of food, putting together, you know, like pinning beautiful handwritten notes to warm jackets to say that they were you know think they were thinking about these people mm. in Calais and that they wanted to do something and that they felt helpless and um yeah there were it was it was absolutely crazy Dan we were just you know inundated by stuff yeah. um so we quickly rented a warehouse in London um and yeah we tried to sort out the donations as best as we could um because yeah cause people, people, started, cause people started giving you money as well right it's like yeah so we had a, we had a crowdfunding um campaign that I set up that night on the way home too it was like a just giving page yeah. with the aim of like 50 quid or something yeah. like just to cover the the cost <laughs> of the journey and that stuff that we got in booker and yeah suddenly we made like a quarter of a million pounds and i was like bonkers oh fuck what are we gonna do with that (laughs) (laughs) like i I, we didn't have a bank account to put it into um just giving hold the money until the campaign is finished i think it's 30 days so we had 30 days to to put some yeah some structure in place and that was the beginning of the worldwide tribe that was what um how it was created that was how it was born so did you, give us because you know this is this is such it's such an incredible story and i think on so many levels and what i've what i what i as a someone just observed from afar but what what fascinated me was that you know obviously and um you know it, you just did you just did it which i always find is just so you know when you see people just responding to what's unfolding <laughs> just trusting it you know trusting that kind of that energy that's there whatever it is and the fear and all the stuff but just you know you you clearly was something there was something pretty powerful happening and you you sort of went with it but when did you how did you kind of decide then okay we've got to set this thing up and what was that like that sort of thinking you know we've done this one-off thing and now now you're actually talking about setting up an organization and can you tell yeah. us a bit about what that was well, like? I think we didn't really have a choice yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I mean so I was at work that first day and I remember it was really stressful because I was at a trade show actually at like, I think I'd got up really early to go to the NEC in Birmingham Ooh. and uh, we I was like selling fabrics and <laughs> also then getting all of these calls to my phone from uh, every single news channel that you can imagine, yeah, right. all of the newspapers and I don't know how they got my number and I was like, what is happening? Yeah. I, you couldn't request me as a friend anymore on Facebook because I'd suddenly like hit my limit and yeah. like, all of these like <laughs> mad things were happening and everyone was, yeah, I mean, I remember just being like, okay, this is mental. It's so um, interesting, is it? Just to there, because I think again, people that might not have been in the, in, in the UK or whatever, but just, you know, you, you went and did something which clearly like, you know, was, was so needed, right? We would sort of, as a, as a country, we were kind of sort of being, hearing this story yeah. feeling this thing going on and we weren't really sure what was happening I and mean, we i think a lot of us sensed that we were being pushed a you know again a load of spin and myth and you know um a, a story that was was not correct and exactly and you went and you went and, and went out there to, to see to see for yourself and that action sort of opened this whole kind of like portal didn't it right from 
you know in, yeah in, in, I, I, into I really the, think yeah. that people were, were ready to hear that 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 side of the story yeah. and i think that that's what um caused such traction on that post is that people wanted to hear the human side and you're absolutely right that they had been reading those same newspapers as me and they mm. had those same questions that i had about the people and that's what we hadn't really been hearing yet and thankfully thankfully between then and now things have changed and we do know more and the the general perception of refugees has changed but at the time yeah it was a, it was a lot of negativity and yeah. i think people were were ready for that that's that different narrative yeah right so you so you so you basically you 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 you're now sort of in this position of like right we've got to we've got to build we've got to start something now with mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. and that was the birth of of the worldwide tribe right Yes, exactly. So yeah, back to your question about structure. Yeah, yeah that was scary. We didn't know. And it was like me, my brothers, um, and then a few friends that quickly came on board to help out. We were kind of doing our best because we also felt the responsibility of like all of these people wanting to do something and giving and donating physically and um, and also financially and also their time and turning that into something tangible and needed on the ground. Yeah. That was, a, you know, bridging that gap felt huge. Um, yeah, right. Because I guess you're, trying to, you're trying to figure out what what is our what is the thing that we can bring into this. I guess. Yeah. What can we do here? What can yeah. we do? And how can we make this? Um, because because these people in the camp they they did need all of these things, and yeah, it was it was difficult. But we um, had the amazing support of this community. Mm. So you know, even if I didn't know how to do something, someone knew someone who knew someone who, who did know, and that's the beauty of social media that yeah. it could brought up people to me that yeah that people stepped up and everybody um was keen to help and get involved and I remember that first day like a friend of a friend was like okay I uh she's worked in PR and she called me and she was like okay for all of these um it gave me like the the very brief like 101 of like how to avoid a question that I didn't know the answer to yeah. when I was having all of these like brief <laughs> quick media training Super useful. <laughs> yeah yeah like things like that you know happened in those first few days and weeks so um yeah we um set up more formally um and quite quickly and yeah it kind of as you say we just had to do we didn't have much chance to think too much yeah. and yeah then it kind of it worked itself out it worked itself out but it was yeah it was an interesting and transformative yeah. time for so me you, definitely so you started off i guess in the early days you tell me like i guess because maybe we can get to now like now what what's the sort of the mission of, of the worldwide tribe but initially mm-hmm. as you were where were you seeing your your place in this story, you know, what was it that you were sort of serving? I guess, I guess there was a lot of stuff going, but I guess you were also having to think about, is this, you know, is this the thing we should be focusing on? Or is it, is this? Yeah. Different? And I guess other, other NGOs and charities must've been starting to pop up as well. And, how did, exactly. How did that so that 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 changed. The landscape was really changing day by day. So you're absolutely right. So whereas at first we were focusing on distributing things like socks and shoes yeah. and stuff, what I soon realised is that well then um, organisations, other amazing organisations, grassroots groups started to pop up and um, we started to work together in the camp. People like Help Refugees who set up a warehouse in Calais and. Yeah started to really formalize that process of physical donations donating in the uk um, and getting those donations across to calais and distributing them so as that started to happen and, and groups like rck refugee community kitchen started to focus on food um we really thought about okay or i really thought about what what can we really give here what what is our space and our our area in this field um where we can really create impact and at that time, you know, our social media um, community was growing and I, people had all of those same questions that I had. And so we continued to document um, the, the, the days in the camp. Every day I was writing about the people that I was meeting, the friends that I was making, the experiences that I was having, the stories that they were telling me. Um, and yeah, uh, this was getting real traction and people were responding and connecting so you, you were so, starting to see this idea of just being able to be almost like the carriers of these stories the sort exactly. of exactly you're telling these stories mm. and 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 really trying to um bring a different um 
yeah, that different narrative, that different perspective and working with people in the camp to tell their own stories. Yeah. And yeah, so that's what we continue to do. And my brother, um, who is the filmmaker, yeah. um, he documented everything, everyone. And we made our first film about the camp called Jangala, that's which right. aimed to um, really tackle some of those initial questions that people had. Four questions it tackled, really. Why did you leave? What tell us the, the journey? So first chunk was about the countries that people left and yeah. why the journey that they made, and then and then life in the camp, and then why they wanted to go to the UK. Yeah, right. So they were the four kind of main areas that we covered in that first film. And what did you learn through that those that inquiry? Because I, I remember that because it was you. Um, I remember the, the film, and but mm -hmm. what, what were you? what was kind of really surprising you or what were the big learnings that you made through that that process because that must have been super interesting as well as probably quite mm -hmm. troubling as well but um yeah I think what one of the main misconceptions that we tried to tackle in that film that was really interesting was that people were not fleeing poverty they were fleeing persecution so right. we were meeting people who were doctors and lawyers and lecturers and academics and you know they were actually the richest people within their communities right. and within their societies who had had the money to be able to make it to Calais in yeah. the first place, crossing the Mediterranean Sea, <clears throat> crossing the Sahara Desert. These are, um, uh, this journey is expensive. You have to pay smugglers. You have, you need money to be able to do it. Mm. Um, many people are left in those countries and unable to make that journey. So that was so something that really opened my eyes that we're talking about people here who are, yeah, educated and that they are um they had amazing lives yeah and jobs so you're busting and, the yeah. myth a little bit that was going on here about sort of you know as we often economic know, like, reasons right sleeping. exactly mm -hmm. and, and, and you know and that kind of backstory that's always around about you know people you know want to they're come coming for our jobs and, so they're coming uh, for our benefits and, exactly exactly yeah, right. that that was something that very, very clearly, very clearly was absolutely not the case because people were leaving nice houses and good jobs to live in tents in the mud in Calais. And right. no one does that for yeah, right. any other reason apart from sheer Fear. desperation, yeah. you know, like there's no other reason. Um, you, you wouldn't do that unless you really, really had to. So that was that was one of the things I think that we really clearly wanted to get across. So you're starting to see that, you know, this interest in, in you know, your kind of capturing these stories helping people understand you know what is going on in the lives of these people that are that are putting themselves through this <clears throat> this mm -hmm, journey mm -hmm. and you're using film and and you would also do photography and also you you because you started doing quite a lot of stuff in the camp as well didn't you like sort of quite creative as my sense was anyway that you were sort yeah, of like helping yeah. kind of bring or help help sort of more of that creativity to happen in a, in a place Absolutely. So really what we wanted to focus on was the things that united us, right. the things that brought us together. That, uh, and, you know, what I, I thought was most important and what people responded to the most in our stories was the uplifting, positive, empowering stories of people actually being the same as we are in yeah. what they the music that they listen to the uh, the things that they like to eat or the football team that they support or so we really focused on those things like food sport um uh, art and creativity music things that brought people together and that we could all connect with um so yeah they're they're the they're the themes really that we focused on in our projects yeah. and we ran little art projects and we organized a uh, football tournament called the liberty cup um so we did various things like that we had little gigs in the camp and uh, yeah music events and uh, all sorts of like food uh, celebrations to yeah lots of things like that um that i think continue to to unite us and that we can kind of connect over regardless of language or religion or yeah. nationality. And you must have been seeing, um, I guess at a time as well where we see, it feels like there's, you know, there's a, <clears throat> there's still in our culture, there's, there's still, you know, increasing divisiveness and, mm -hmm. and also people just almost, you know, on the, on the, one thing that struck me by looking at, you know, the, some of the films and the, the stories and some of your stuff we've heard from coming through your work is this kind of togetherness that you've experienced in these places. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of interesting in this kind of like, 
you know, in the in our kind of like inverted commas, highly developed <laughs> societies, we're, we're sort of experiencing, we seem to be experiencing a bit of a crisis of loneliness as sort of people are tending to sort of pursue Hello. quite kind of solo well, lives now of, you know, getting ahead of everyone and, you know what I mean? And it's, mm-hmm. you, it's interesting that you're, you, you, you've you been experiencing this in the probably the bleakest of conditions, um, uh, a, a real sense of, of togetherness, of, 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 yeah, like you say, the, the worldwide tribe of, of a sort of uh, cooperation, I guess. Um, that... Absolutely, Dan. It was so interesting to me that, um, you know, what, what the people in the camp had yeah. that we didn't have, that we lack, and we may have lots of things that they lack, like, you know, in in terms of like physical stuff, yeah. like a house and food on the table and, and 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 a bed and all of these things. But they had something that was more important than all of that, and that was the community. And it was really, really clear to me that actually, yeah, they had love for one another mm. and a real strong sense of community, and that was more powerful than yeah any of those things that we attach importance to yeah. um and that was re- that was um, that was the biggest and continues to be the biggest takeaway for me is that yeah you're absolutely right that we actually deep down we're, we're searching for that right often here in the west right. um, especially like living in london that you can be surrounded by people but still feel lonely and yeah, in the camp, um, Calais was the jungle was a very, very magical and special place for the fact that people came from all over the world, spoke different languages, there were different religions, but there was a mosque and a church next to each other. And people, you know, I asked someone once if that was ever a problem, and they said no. Like we're we're fleeing war. All we want is peace, and we want to live yeah, happily right. alongside each other. And that's the whole point. That's why we're here. Um, yeah, because I remember. So, that, I think it was. I'm guessing it was one of your films, but uh, that. I remember seeing these, you know, you documented these, you know, these different places of, of worship that have that were, were created and extraordinary things, extraordinary kind of spaces and like the creativity and, you know, ingenuity required to build these things out of whatever they could get their hands on, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they were, they, they seemed like sort of stunning. It was something quite sort of, I, I felt sort of quite, yeah, you know, sort of mind blowing actually, or, you know. Because it is obviously you could you know you could see that the conditions were really po- really bad, but mm-hmm. what was extraordinary was the sort of the creativity I guess um, that that was that was being expressed um, exactly with these constraints, and then and then seeing all of that getting torn down. I remember seeing that. Tell it because so just to give people a sense of that camp and the jungle, and because it, it came to a head, right? It did. It grew to about 10,000 people um, at its max in 2016. And yeah, you're absolutely right that it grew into a little town in its own right. There were mosques and churches and schools and there was a high street with restaurants and shops and people did really make the best of the situation by, yeah, making it as homely as they possibly could. And you're absolutely right that creativity came out of that crisis and people were resourceful with what little that they had. Mm. And the volunteers, more and more volunteers um, came, especially from the UK, like a huge influx of UK-based volunteers. And it was incredible to see how something could be built out of the mud like that. Yeah. And were you Um, getting kind of all kinds of requests for people to volunteer coming through your network? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Everything from like, you know, dentists wanting to support people who had... uh, terrible toothache yeah. which happened a lot in the camp because they didn't really have access to health or care whilst there then yeah. undocumented and uh, to yeah people I met a lady once who had gone out to Calais with nothing but a foot spa and was going round and washing refugees wow. feet and I just thought that was the most yeah. beautiful thing ever yeah. <laughs> wow. so yeah yeah um and then so because i'm and so because i and then yeah it, i guess and then the scale and then the, i guess the 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 the, 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 the french decided yeah. no more really wasn't it? it was that 
The, well, the I think government. it was. I think it was communally the French and the British government. Right. I think that the French government were probably under pressure from the UK government to not allow a settlement of people there on the border to the UK, attempting to cross to the UK. Um, so I think it was uh, accumulation combined of both efforts. combined, a combination, yeah. exactly that. Um, to disperse the people living there, um, but not really provide a satisfactory solution for them. So, yeah, because so, yeah. that, yeah, so ha- that, you know, when you, I mean, the bits of film I've seen of that, that, you know, that destruction, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, and it, I mean, it's harrowing. And you, I, I mean, you can't imagine what it must have been like to be, to sort of experience that, you know, to be part of people, you know, the desperation anyway, and then to try and develop some kind of hopeful sort of interim place i guess Mm -hmm. and then to see that come down it was mad it was so mad again that was like the films i'll put the films and stuff in the links for this for people that want to have a look yeah we made two films about this we made um one called the lotus flower which highlighted everything that had been built out of the mud basically so all of those shops and restaurants and entrepreneurial the the community that had been created um so that was an 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 attempt to stop the demolition of the camp um and then the camp was demolished in its entirety and we made a film called the end of the jungle Mm -hmm. and that um highlights the confusion that people didn't know where to go or what to do next basically they didn't have the information that they needed some buses were provided um to take people to accommodation centers or detention centers but people didn't know where they would be going or what would happen to them when they got on the bus they were scared of being deported. Right, um, right. That's so, terrifying. Yeah, yeah. So lots of people didn't get on those buses and then it left them in Calais living, you know, in the, in amongst the trees without the the protection and the the structure that the jungle had had um, enabled volunteers and, and, and refugees together to create, you yes. know, daily food distributions and things like that. People knew where they needed to go if they needed how uh, dental care or if they needed medication or if they needed food or a new pair of shoes there was, there that was, was a kind of a, yeah there's an infrastructure that was yeah, created absolutely. right and that absolutely. gave people a sense a some sense of not normality but i guess it's just a sense of there was an ability to have some kind of yeah some, as close some as possible. vague certainties i guess in amongst all the mm-hmm. uncertainty exactly exactly so to, to take that away again was really really heartbreaking and I'll never forget that period of time either where yeah people who had lost their homes once before were losing their homes again yeah and uh yeah it was really really difficult crazy I think period of time that will or should go down in history is yeah something that you would never expect to be happening in France in 2016 basically And give us a sense, I know, you know, I know you've sort of documented it, but, but just in terms of also we've done to have the types of people, I guess in the age group, in the age range, what, how many, you know, because it, it was hard to really again to figure out, um, you know, what was, what was, you know, what was this population made up or, you know, what sort mm-hmm. of people and what sort, you know. Can you give us a bit yeah. of a sense of that? It's a good question. And I think that people saw a lot of images of men, young yeah. men. Um, and that was the case that it was majority men in the camp. Um, there were lots of women too and some children, lots of unaccompanied minors who we're talking like 13, 14, 15 teenage boys. Um, so, but the, there's many I mean, reasons that's crazy why. crazy though, isn't it? Like being, yeah, I mean, mad. I've got a 13 year old son, you know, and so the idea of him like traveling, you know, across countries on foot mm, and then living and then, like that yeah i mean mm-hmm. you just it just doesn't compute does it exactly and you know what i was just in paris last week and the situation there is still 250 unaccompanied minors children generally all boys um living on the streets of paris at the moment and wow. yeah it is they're all from like between 13 and 16 so yeah, it's still ongoing. Wow. And how how does that how does that work or not work? I mean, how does 
So, so these are these often, are kids that have that were in Calais or who are still often coming? they're fleeing conscription. So um, for two of my brothers, this is the case. Or uh, so in the example of um, my Eritrean brother, yeah. he's fleeing compulsory military service, and that can start from any age, from about thirteen upwards, and go on for life. So that's wow. the reason why lots of people are leaving, so that they're not having to fight um, for something that they yeah they they don't believe in in the afghans too often where is um, where is eritrea exactly is this a country i don't know that much about yeah good question yeah. it's in east africa uh-huh. and it got its independence from ethiopia i think in 1993 yeah. well, I, I actually don't know so i shouldn't say that but yeah, yeah it's, it's uh, near ethiopia border sudan east africa okay and it's quite a volatile country right now yes yeah. it's under under a dictatorship um uh-huh. and uh, yeah, a very, very um, oppressive dictatorship that d- means that everybody does compulsory military service. Mm-hmm. It's uh, unending, goes on for life. Wow. Um, and yeah, it's, there's crazy things happening there at the moment. I think they have the most um, international journalists in jail there from any country in the oh, world really? i think i i read recently wow. um that yeah it's it's difficult to document what's happening there fully because yeah it's very um difficult to get that information yeah. out <clears throat> so there's a lot of young <clears throat> men and boys that are mm-hmm. making this journey to mm-hmm. and and so and so tell me about this paris setup right now what's what's this what's been in Paris, uh, yeah. So how how are, how are people? So they so I guess so, so is is that a sense that Paris is more is because the Calais camp is no more? Is, is that is that why people are looking to other places, or is it just tell me how? They, yeah, you know, why so gathering? lots of people did go to Paris after um, Calais and the the jungle was demolished. Yeah. So there's probably a couple of thousand refugees living on the streets of Paris at the moment, but it's difficult to say a number because they're not really documented, right. or registered by anybody. Yeah. Or any any one body or organisation. So, um, and and that causes a lot of problems as well because you've got these vulnerable kids that are not protected in any way. Yeah. So if they go missing, and which happened when the jungle was demolished, many of the the kids that were in the camp went missing, and no one's looking for them because yeah, they're not documented to be in France. Um, so that's a super scary thing too that they're vulnerable to to horrible things happening to them here um, or in France. Mm. So, yeah, in Paris, it's a tricky situation to keep them, just to to keep them a little bit protected and safe. But there's amazing organisations working in Paris to make sure that they have a meal every day um, and that they have a point of reference to go to to try and get them into the system, to try and get them into school or at least um, applying for asylum so that they're recognised by the authorities as as being there yeah right because you're undocumented you're you're in this kind of sort of you're just detached right you're in this kind of you can't you can't you're almost just trapped yeah you're in a bit of a limbo where yeah you can't move forward but you definitely can't go back and yeah you, you don't really exist um in terms of jobs or any kind of welfare yeah you can't get health care or education or Kind of mm-hmm. everything requires some form of documentation, right? So, particularly yeah. as you get older, I guess, as well. Exactly, exactly. Um, <laughs> and the thing is, um, you want to go through that that process as quickly as possible um, and, and get into the uh, your asylum procedures because uh, it's it's better for you as a, as a minor. Um, you are, you know, more likely to be treated better than when you turn 18. Um, so it's important to do, if you're under 16 or under 18, to to, to get through that process get, as quickly yeah, as possible. Before, before you become yeah. this kind of like seen as an adult and more complicated yeah. and... And, and and more likely to be deport, deported. Right. So, yeah, and that's tricky because in France, the, the process is, um, you know, they have many people applying and so the process is slow. Yeah. Um, so it can take, yeah, months and months before you're kind of interviewed. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lengthy, lengthy process. Yeah. Also in the UK. Yeah. So you're, so, so right now, so the World War Tribe today, you, you talk about, um, you know, this it seems like there's, there's the two main things your work is focused on. So it's the story sharing, bringing awareness mm-hmm. of these issues and the stories of, um, 
of people that are on the move, you know, that are moving, mm -hmm. uh, escaping, fleeing, all kinds of, you know, things that most of us in our com fairly comfortable world here can't imagine, right? And um, and trying to bust that kind of myth and, and break down these barriers that we're, we're feeling. And then there's this other piece of what you're doing around in the refugee camps, which 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 you work quite in, in a variety of countries now, right? Where you're supporting projects in mm -hmm. different camps. Can you t is that? Can you tell us about? Because you've, I remember, I remember Greece then came up, didn't it? As a sort of yeah. So, post so then one of our exactly one of our team members, even while we were working in Calais, um, Dan went out to Greece to Lesbos yeah. and really saw the need for people to be working on the shorelines, meeting boats, bringing boats to, to shore, even uh, individual volunteers who didn't have any experience of any kind of search and rescue or anything like that. Because these were boats, just again, so the boats, these were coming from, because Greece from suddenly Turkey. became this spot, didn't it? And these were boats mm -hmm. coming from, was it from Turkey? Was that... From Turkey, yeah. People were crossing from Izmir to Lesbos and to Chios and um, to, yeah, these Greek islands that many of us might have like holidayed on in the past. Yeah. And, well, I remember can, seeing those surreal photos, wasn't there? There was a sort of surreal photos. I remember, yeah, tourists remember. like lying on the same yeah. beaches as, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You'd be like, sort of lying on lying on these kind of like sunbeds while there's like like people crawling out of the water with life jackets yeah. on. It, yeah, it was just surreal. Mad, exactly. So yeah, so in 2015 we started working there too, and we continue to work where we can in Greece, supporting projects where we can. Um, so Dan is still in Greece. He's running a football project now. It's called Aniko. Uh -huh. And, uh, yeah, I'm still focusing on, on sports development. Um, and, yes, the situation there, there's still a big camp in, in Lesbos called Moria Camp, and mm -hmm. it's, it's bitterly cold there at the moment. So winter is very difficult there. It's, it's hugely overpopulated. Um, so, yeah, the, the situation continues to be really really extreme but the, the it's less reported in our media at the moment than it was back at that time in 2015 2016 but the crisis is definitely still ongoing yeah. so it's important to yeah continue to be sharing these stories i think and um so what, where else is the you know what's the today like, where are we now we're in um we're in the start of 2019 can you give us a sense yes. of of what's ahead for you guys now and, and where's your focus and what are you hoping to do more of? Or Yeah, yeah. definitely. So we've got an, another amazing partner in Turkey um, who we work with and we've worked in, so we, we worked in Izmir yeah. um, and in Lesbos, so either sides of that crossing. And um, we did a little art project in Jordan. Um, but currently uh, one of them, uh, I should probably tell you about one of our, or our main projects over the last few years um, actually came from, a, a real need in Calais um, that people kept asking us if they could borrow our phones to make a phone call home or if we could hotspot them so that they could have some access to internet and information about their asylum claims or whatever or some you know things like that yeah. or whether we had a charger so they could charge their own phones so it became really clear that people needed access to, wi to the internet, to <laughs> Wi-Fi. Exactly, exactly. So um, we met this amazing guy, Rich, who uh -huh. was working in sub-Saharan Africa with Microsoft um, at the time to um, bring Wi-Fi to rural areas in places like Kenya. Yeah. Um, so he went about setting up the first Wi-Fi network in the Calais jungle in 2015 with my brother, um, gaffer taping it together and using cable ties and stuff where we could. Um, before Brilliant. another team member, Samson, came on board, who was a sculptor and fabricator and started to make the system much more beautiful and <laughs> fit, fitted it inside a box because when the camp was demolished, we lost a lot of equipment and realised, like, okay, we need to actually make the system mobile. Um, so, yeah, so we b built a Wi-Fi box that's low cost and works in this kind of rugged environment um, and can connect up to a thousand people. Amazing. Uh, You've got a name for this, right? It's... Yes, Jangala Wi-Fi. Jangala so, Wi-Fi, love it. Yes, <laughs> because of that first system that was called Jangala, yeah. based on the jungle. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that's become an entity in its own right. Jangala or Janga.la is the website site and uh -huh. uh, Nils Rich and Sampson continue to build these boxes in a workshop in Walthamstow. 
Wow, so amazing. So that's gone from strength to strength. And are these, where are these going out then? To all over the place? Yeah. So at the end of last year, I think we reached fourth continent so we have um one in kakuma camp in kenya that was uh -huh. our first one to go out to a refugee camp in africa uh -huh. they're all over europe in france and in greece um we sent one to lesbos um sorry to we we have a few in lesbos but we sent one to lombok after the earthquake last wow. year yeah um to help with relief efforts there and we also at the end of last year sent one to the mexico um the uh usa mexico border mm -hmm. um and yeah so we are expanding there quickly and rapidly and next week i'm going out to see a system in italy and a system in bosnia two systems in bosnia one on the croatia bosnia border and one on the serbia bosnia border um and see them in action so that project um and that yeah has has, has gone has no, grown I mean, it's like massive kudos hugely. to you guys it's just amazing i think that's just it's i mean You'd never, and I think that's this. There's something in in. Well, there's so much in your story, but there's always there's something I'm always drawn to. Is just this, just just go and do things, and you know, just trust trust that something will come. From something it. will happen. You know, I ha I didn't know anything about Wi-Fi. Yeah, never right. Did I think that I'd be involved in like this tech startup world that yeah. the Jangala team now find ourselves in. Um, but yeah, we rolled with it. <laughs> you know, just like pushing yourself, putting yourselves on that on that uh, that first crossing and heading out there. And, and and then, you know, like you say, installing kind of uh, Wi-Fi systems in yeah, who refugee knew? camps. Who, who, who the, knew? Who the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> Not Incredible. me when I was working in, yeah, fashion design like yeah, three wow. and a half years ago or so. Um, I did not see myself here. No, that is for sure. But such but so, is life, eh? Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> so the Wi-Fi thing is feels like quite a big deal. That feels like a quite a... Yeah. It was a huge yeah. need that you've, you've, you've sort of, you've seen the... the the need for it and help solve it, which is amazing. Yeah, that has been, yeah, exactly, as you say, just uh, probably our main focus for 2018. Yeah. And 2019, will con it will continue to grow. But from a worldwide tribe perspective, we're also looking to be continue to be telling stories and making films about the situation in some places that we're hearing even less about. Like, uh, I have a plan to go to uh, to Tel Aviv to make a film about Sudanese refugees there oh, wow. um, and I also want to um well, I have been in the process of making a film about my first little brother Mez and his journey um because he re is re represents a lot of young boys who made a similar journey or are making a similar journey and yeah it's still very um important to be getting that story out there and he represents the african route um that people take from libya to italy which was less documented and still right. less documented um but is still being made by many eritreans many sudanese um, and he's now you know so he's now he's with you guys he's in the he's yeah in the can. So how, i mean, I mean he's obviously... 18 he's done it he's finished school he's working uh, he's studying he's at college and he is um working for domino's pizza delivering pizzas Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> he's living the teenage <laughs> yeah, exactly, teenage dream yeah. <laughs> yeah he's he's amazing yeah. he's my absolute inspiration and all three of my little brothers um i have an eritrean brother an afghan brother and a sudanese brother now Incredible. my sudanese brother is new he's just um came to the uk about three months ago i think right. it was his three month anniversary in england this week um so yeah on sunday last sunday i think so he is also incredible he didn't speak any english when he came and already he came to me on sunday with my family and he's speaking he's he's definitely communicating with without any problems um and he's come out of his shell a lot he was quite quiet and serious at first and now yeah. he's super cheeky and funny um so yeah all three of them have just it's been incredible to to watch them grow and also to see our culture through their eyes has really taught us a lot too so yeah, it's been a mutually beneficial experience all around it's been awesome and how have how have people around you responded to this mission that you have gone on and now you know it's you know obviously it's like you know it's, it's extraordinary where it's heading but also the how you've you know, you're you're sort of living this in 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 um, you know so deeply across everything you do, not just the work, but you know the, you've bought you know 
new brothers into your family and how have people around you responded to all of this generally very very positively yeah. i think the people around me are supportive and amazing of course because we put a lot out on social media yeah. That means that you do open yourself up to negativity. Naturally, people online can be more cruel or uh, or quicker to, yeah, to, to be negative. And we have had our fair share of negativity and anti-immigration sentiment and those classic things that you hear, like they should go back to their own country yeah. kind of ideas. Um, we do get that. We do. Um, but generally, the people around me are what keep me doing what I'm doing because yeah, they're yeah, supportive yeah. and positive and and I think meeting anyone who's met Mez or my two other brothers too, they also see that, you know, there's no, there's no way that I could be doing anything else right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is important. It's just, and, it's just a, it's an interesting question, I think, not on so many fronts. And, you know, you know Joshua Coombs, and I was chatting with Josh a bit about this from a sort of homeless perspective, you know. Mm -hmm. that, you know, we're so conditioned to sort of, you know, to, to think in a certain way or to believe things, you know what I mean? And then what is it in, a, when is it that we sort of cut ourselves off from others or do you know what I mean? Or we have, we start to build yeah. a different perception because kids don't, you know, when they're young, they you exactly. Know, do you know and how I mean? can we break down those barriers again? How can we unpick those layers yeah. of judgment right. that we, we form? Yes, absolutely. And it, 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 um, you're right relates to not just refugees but also homelessness around us or anyone that we might have a kind of judgment or, well, yeah, we think, or stereotype I, they're not around like me. i'm not like them it's that yeah. kind of that's you don't thing, relate yeah and that enables you to be able to walk past someone who right. is sleeping on the street right without any emotional connection right. or attachment because yeah you you tell yourself a story to make it okay right. i think and we need to we need to retell those stories because it's not okay yeah right and and you know and, and it's also just um it's very it's a very live uh question for me at the moment this whole thing and you know this whole just un understanding how we unpick that you know that how that actually gets ingrained in us do you know what i mean because actually i think mm -hmm. mo you know when you scratch if you scratch you know if you sort of spend a bit of time with a lot more you know most people nowadays you get under the surface fairly quick and you you know ultimately i think i think most people want to be human right they they, they want they want to be and even if they don't know it yet right. they definitely do right. <laughs> exactly but, but yeah that's some... what makes us feel good i believe and alive yeah. and connected and like purposeful and yeah the reason to get up in the morning is that like yeah we are, we are all in this together we're all connected and i really believe that like if you if our neighbor is struggling or hungry or you know in pain then that is going to have an effect or an impact on all of us yeah we all, we all will feel that and yeah maybe maybe you're not so maybe some of us, including me, sometimes are not in tune enough with that. But I think that, yeah, we we are all absolutely in this in this together. Yeah, right. So what? Um, how can people get involved? What What do you What you know? What? I mean, I guess there's two things here. I guess the first thing. Well, let's talk about World War Tribe first. Like, what? What? Um, mm -hmm. You know, where? Yeah, how can people get involved? What? What are your? You know, do you still have things you're trying to crack? Where? Are there things you you know where you you're looking for inputs or help or tell us yeah about that. always always <laughs> so uh, the most important thing I think is to connect with us um, and join the community on social media first yeah. and foremost and easy and accessible to everybody to yeah connect with us on Instagram or on Facebook um, okay it's the Worldwide Tribe on Instagram uh, or one word and then the worldwide tribe on facebook cool i'll put one um, i'll put all this in the in the links on the show notes perfect yeah so i think first and foremost and read the stories and share them and start honest open conversation and about these topics um i think all of us all of us can do that and all of us have a responsibility to be doing that because this is happening all around us um but also you know there's varying levels on our website how you can get involved so if you have time to give or money to give or neither of those um or both of those yeah there's ways that you can get involved by volunteering or donating or um so yeah there's there's something for everybody and even if it's not the refugee crisis or working with refugees um there are 
I, I believe that there's something in a, a way that all of us can be doing something yeah. um, for somebody else, whether it's a local homeless shelter or uh, the person who lives next door to you, whoever it might be. Maybe it's someone who's lonely or needs some love or whatever. There's someone or something out there that, that yeah, that you can do. Nice. Everyone's got something to give. <laughs> nice. Exactly. And, <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 funny, isn't it? And that's um, I think that, yeah, we was chatting, was chatting about this yesterday. This, and that's this conversation I actually had in the last episode with with Joshua Coombs. We were just talking about it again, like you know, just sometimes it just starts with just yeah, just just that attention bit, just giving attention, um, mm-hmm. and giving some presence and some time to uh, folks around you who who maybe aren't getting any attention, you know, and whether that's someone on the street or someone next or whatever, but you know, maybe that's the first gift is just giving some time. Um, exactly. And, and listening. Exactly. Um, and Josh talks about that a lot, that like that's the most important and valuable thing that we have to give. Yeah. Really. So thinking about like all the, you know, if you could like from what you've seen and learned, which obviously is shed loads, you know, about why people are moving, um, why people are on the move, you know, and, you know, I do, you know, I, I do have been exploring, you know, climate change for the last decade and what that is, you know, all that, what that is bringing on. And migration is, is, is a massive part of what we're going to see more and more of. Right. And it's going to Mm -hmm. make, from what I understand, it's going to make the numbers of people fleeing that we see at the moment look like, you know, nothing, you know, it's sort of, um, as as things like climate change the conditions mainly around things like food right or flooding mm-hmm. or i think you know there's a there's a lot of work that's been done around <clears throat> why syria <clears throat> why the, the syrian refugee situation you know ultimately i think there's a there was a, a lot of uh evidence that suggests this started from from um you know droughts and mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> people moving into the cities because um of food shortages um yeah. but i guess if if we if we accept the fact that we're going to see more and more people moving around the world fleeing mm-hmm. you know whether it's climate related or oppression or whatever whatever it is um if that if that is part of the world that's sort of unfolding what how you know what, what things in your sense would would start to ease, I mean, you know, what needs to happen? I, mean, I know it's complex, it's hard to say it, but are there some, you know, if you could change some things tomorrow <laughs> that, that would that would radically sort of at least start to address some of the issues these people mm-hmm. are facing, what, what, would it, what, that, what would that be? What would it look like? Well, I mean, I can, I can answer that question in a number of ways, <laughs> like very specific things like the UK government yeah. needs to open an immigration office in Calais, for example, so that people can apply for asylum not on UK soil and risking their lives to, to cross um, the border into the UK. Yeah. So th- things like that, tangible steps. But on a, on a bigger, wider, applying to us all scale, I think that we just need to continue to be more open to each other's differences and embracing each other's differences yeah. and, and and accepting that, yeah, like there is more that unites us than divides us. And when we embrace those things and we see those things and we see them as a positive and we lead with love rather than fear, then that's what's going to bring us together yeah. i believe because you're absolutely right that there's only going to be more movement and more migration based on an environmental climate change refugees absolutely will yeah. increase um we will start to see that and yeah i think that we already benefit so much from um, a mix of culture and religion, nationality, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in, in our everyday communities, especially in London, for example. Um, that if we recognise these things and embrace them and enjoy them, then and and, and start to change our, our mindsets about, around that, then that's only going to be a really, really positive thing. Yeah, like yeah, and I think you you talk about this on your site, but it's effectively, you're, you know, it's this idea of like, how do we? It, it it's it's sort of um, it's opening up more to to what it means to be a human right and um this idea that we're we're you know i'm very interested in you know this idea of 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 
being planetary. You know, we're all off one planet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hence, hence the spaceship Earth. And like, you know, we're we're li- we're literally on a life giving rock flying through the universe. Do you know what I mean? I mean, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> so it's, it's crazy. Like... And 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 it, what's more crazy is that we've divided it up into this bit's mine and this bit's right. yours. And and on that rock, nobody owns any of it. You know, yeah. we should be able to you go where we please on that rock yeah. and it doesn't make sense that some in some parts we have an abundance and in some part and we have more food than we can eat and in some parts people are starving and yeah this is mad we need to do some serious redistribution <laughs> yeah yeah right amazing so i asked this question which you've sort of a kind of you've you've kind of sort of you've sort of addressed it but i'm going to ask it anyway because it's what i do at the end of the thing so it's the idea okay. that it's the idea that um uh it was a, a an amazing um uh, uh, kind of designer, author, writer, thinker called Buckminster Fuller, who who had this idea of the spaceship Earth, which which I use. But he had this phrase: um, uh, "There are no passengers on spaceship Earth; we're all crew," um, and which I love. And uh, and I was just thinking, um, just for kind of our listeners and kind of like where you're seeing the world, like where would you, if if you if you could get more people, more crew on the uh, uh, doing things right now, where where would you where where do we need more crew in the world right now? What do we need people to be doing? <laughs> I like that. I haven't heard that before. I think, yeah, you're absolutely right that we all need to be doing and that in every sense, in every, we, we, we don't have the, um, excuse anymore of not having the information available to us because with social media and we know we have information at our fingertips at all times and also you know geographical distance this is happening on our doorstep you can help people um, and and be active in your own community so I think yeah to to take responsibility for that and to to recognize your part in that Mm. um, is really really important that we can't be ignorant to it anymore um so yeah it's not, yeah. Someone, it's not someone else it's not someone else's thing i think that's the it, exactly and you and and there's only so long that you yeah can sit back and, and be a passenger when yeah we all absolutely do need to be actively being crew i like that i like <laughs> i remember that <laughs> <laughs> brilliant well look jazz on that note thank you so much for um for sharing some of that story it's um i think it's what you guys are doing is just like huge kudos to you you're just sort of like you've you've just thrown yourself into this thing and i think you know it's it's amazing to to watch and to see and to hear the you know the stories and how you're shifting stuff and and then again the things that are coming out of it and the support you know the ways that you're building support into these places and the you know and the connections you're making so just yeah fair play to you and your crew and we will um well i will share um you know links to all the all your work for anyone that's interested in in getting in touch and we'll stay in touch for sure and um yeah good luck with um, thank you dan the year ahead thank you i Um, appreciate it yeah yeah, great to chat to you yeah lovely to talk we'll connect soon so there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, that was the uh, the incredible Jazz O'Hara um, from the Worldwide Tribe. What an what an epic story! Eh? Um, do check out their work. Um, check out what they're up to because they are super active and um, popping up all over the place. They're on the ground all over the world. Um, follow their Instagram. You'll start to see the the work they're doing, the places they're at, the stories that they're sharing of of so many people that are on the move um to try and find security love community um it's quite extraordinary um so check out their work check out some of the films that jazz referred to um the films they made out in the uh, the the calais jungle um i'll put them all in the show notes um quite incredible some of the films and some of the footage um and just yes if you're if you're inspired by what they're doing just support their work there's many ways you can um just just by sharing their work and the stories that they're that they're um, surfacing or get involved you know they're always looking for extra hands and donations and all kinds of great stuff so um yeah hope you enjoyed that one <clears throat> so as ever um yeah if you're enjoying the podcast please um yeah give me a give me some feedback um uh comments um you can rate the podcast in apple podcasts um it's all good if you like it because it it, <clears throat> it does just help raise 
it would surface the podcast for more people to find. So if you like what you're hearing, you like what I'm trying to do here, um, massive appreciation for any feedback. But likewise, um, you know, if stuff's just doing your head in, let me know. It's always useful as well. Um, I've actually just built a little home now for all the podcasts. So there is now a site, uh, www. The spaceship dot earth. Um, so you'll find all the podcasts I've done so far now, all under uh, all in one home, and you can find ways to access them through different platforms: SoundCloud, um, Acast, Apple Podcasts, and probably more. When I get the time to keep keep adding them on. Um, so yeah, and you'll find a little bit more about each guest there. They'll have their own page, um, links out to their work um, and stuff. So yeah, if you like uh, this stuff, please do share with anyone else you think might like it. Um, it's all it's all helpful. Um, and then also inspired inspired by actually one of my favourite podcasts, which um, is the Looking Sideways Action Sports uh, Podcast run by Matt Barr, which is amazing. Um, uh, it's um, And, and uh, I was inspired recently, well, I was inspired by uh, Matt's move into um, offering a few T-shirts to sport his podcast. So I've, I've followed his, uh, his example. So right now there's a, little, there's a little link you can see in the nav on uh, the spaceship.earth to merch. And uh, I've just... Um, done a couple of very simple designs for some uh, t-shirts and hoodies um, for the spaceship earth all provided by the um, most excellent uh, t-mill um, which is a, is a um, an amazing kind of um, digital tea merch printer based out in the isle of Wight, doing everything uh, very very planetary and ethically um, wonderful organic cotton and um, wind powered printing and all kinds of stuff like that so um, yeah if you if you like uh, if you fancy a tea or a hoodie you know Please head away your way to the merch store. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's uh, it's uh, it's not going to. Um, I'm not going to be giving up my day job, but um, yeah, just anything that can help um, help maybe support the ongoing. I've got a lot more plans this year, more requests coming in, more episodes I want to do with um, different people. So um, yeah, if you fancy a tea um, or or whatever, then um, help yourself. It'd be very nice to see them out there in the world. Um, so yeah, if you want to hit me up, it's Dan at the spaceship dot earth. Um, or you can get me currently. I haven't really switched. I'm still using my own, uh, Instagram, which is at Dan solos on Twitter at Dan solo. Wondering whether I just put it all under the spaceship earth. I don't know. Maybe decisions, decisions. I have to sort of talk to myself at my next uh, strategic board meeting. Uh, just me and the dog. Um, anyway, I hope you're enjoying uh, this stuff. Um, yes, until next time, remember folks, there are no passengers on Spaceship Earth. We're all crew. Take good care of yourself out there. Peace and out. Mm-hmm.